by promoting in Israel. It's oh, women, it's Barry Phillips, wrong program. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's something today. I uh, uh, we had to switch programs here, so I've got to get into a different mode. Uh, good morning, Barry. How are you? I know that you're in Gloucester. I'm wet, and I'm doing well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah, um, I'll be on with Hanok Young here in just a few moments as he is back in Modi'in, Israel. And uh, try, I guess probably by now he's over jet lag. And uh, we'll have to see what all his uh, thoughts are on the Ukraine situation and the Jews that are, are there. And uh, it should be an exciting program. But between now and then, uh, we have... Uh, foundations for a life to do and uh very you know there's a there's a verse that you've heard me quote uh somewhere north of a bazillion times i know uh, which one you're gonna say <laughs> you already got it right yeah i know that uh, uh a verse that was has, has been life transforming for me uh and that is the the verse out of proverbs chapter 18 16 a man's gift will make room for him. Uh, this is such an important word for us, and I believe it's an important word for us today. Um, the If you ever get the address of that scripture wrong and go to Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, it is pride comes before a fall. <laughs> mm, I, I think that the two there are tied together pretty well. So um, let, let's consider this verse again, because is something that I've kind of been working through and, and dealing with. Um, I, I think from the time I started ministry, um, Barry, how many people have you ministered to over your just south of a bazillion years of ministry that uh, they're, they just, they, they saw the scripture uh but just didn't feel themselves worthy mm. of the blessings of the um, of, of walking in the scripture, and it held them back throughout their lives. Uh, immediately, what would come to my mind is about twenty-five to thirty percent, probably somewhere around, uh, you know, one out of every four folks. I mean, people. People will get the word. Sometimes it takes a while, mm -hmm. you know, for lights to come on and that kind of thing. It takes encouragement. It takes pulling. It takes training to get people to a you. place of becoming fruit bearing. Uh, you you shared that scripture from from Proverbs. What comes to my mind, Mike, is Yochanan or John fifteen where Yeshua says that as he is the vine and we are the branches, he is mm -hmm. communicating that we're strategically and vitally connected to him so as to become fruit-bearing people. And he says, if you fail to bear the fruit, my father will cut you off. Mm -hmm. This is like any, you know, any gardener, any uh, caretaker of an orchard, if you have limbs on a tree that have nothing on them, they're sucking up the energy uh, from the trunk and giving nothing in return. So you cut them off. Mm -hmm. That in turn puts more energy, more sap into the producing branches. But even he said, even if you produce, I will still prune you. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time I went to an apple orchard, I imagine what I saw was a kid in the neighborhood. Somebody's apple tree is huge, got big, big top, lots of foliage. And some apples on it. These were minuscule trees. They had been cut and cut and cut. Oh. And I think those scraggly little things is all they've got to produce apples. <laughs> but when you went in to buy the apples or to pick the apples, they were they were big. They were robust. They were colorful. Mm -hmm. and it's because they were each tree. Each tree was pruned to become not only productive in volume but in quality. Yeah. And uh, yeah. getting an individual to step up into quality as well as quantity, that yeah. doesn't happen when you say, I ask Jesus into my heart. It don't work that way. Yeah. Yeah. It takes time. 
this, this verse that you quoted of, uh, I am the vine, you are the branches. You know, that, that's a verse that we can, we can read over uh, all too fast. The transforming time for me was going to Israel the first time with Hayavel and actually pruning the vines there in Israel. Uh -huh. um, I remember walking out on Harbor Ka, the Mount of Blessing, uh, past the Mixon and down the road uh, over toward the, the overlook of, uh, of Shem. And Josh, Nate, a number of the others were there, and they were they were going to teach us how to cut these vines that morning. These we were in the, um, I think we were in Cabernet that day, and these vines are just, I mean, they're massive. Uh, in in they've grown way taller than I am. Uh, they've already been harvested, and they're telling us to cut them back to. The, each vine this far, a quarter of an inch at times from the, the branch from the vine. And it's like, I'm going to kill this thing. Well, it was amazing when I went back that same year for the harvest to go to those same vines and to see the fruit that was on those vines. What I thought was going to kill the vine was actually its, its, uh, its ability to produce. Now, Back to the verse, you are the, I am the vine, you are the branches. Okay, what is between, what is at the end of the, of the branch? That's where the fruit is. So if we are not willing to be the branch, it's like, you know, the, the fruit can pray for the vine to produce. It's not, it, what does the vine produce? The vine doesn't produce fruit. The branch, the branch produces fruit. And therein lies this cooperation. But what if we don't see ourselves as worthy of that sap flowing through us? Let me give you a, another orchard story. I heard this, uh, a preacher was relating how he walked with his father-in-law into his father-in-law's peach orchard. And they were just talking, walking through the orchard, and he saw a particular tree that somebody had taken a hatchet mm -hmm. and hacked on it terribly and then buried the head of the hatchet into the tree. And the man looked at his father-in-law and says, I can't believe somebody did that to one of your trees. If one of my youngest did that, you let me know. I'll tan their hides. <laughs> and his father looked at him and said, calm down. I did that. Uh -huh. He said, why would you do that to your own tree? He said, oh, I didn't hurt it none. He said, I just stressed it a little bit. That mm -hmm. tree is lazy and doesn't want to produce. Now it's fighting for life in its estimation, and it will cause it to bring forth fruit. Mike, there are times that Yah allows circumstances that we think have been a hatchet and a hack job to us, mm -hmm. and Yah has just allowed circumstances and situations to stress us to the place who are desperate enough to pray, if your prayer life is stagnant or non-existent, Yah's not above poking you, prodding you, even stressing you to get you to talk to him. Because there is, Yah is not looking for us to simply engage in a spiritual exercise or demand of prayer he wants to talk to us. There are things he needs to communicate to us. And if we're not talking, we're not listening. If we're not acting, we're not listening. Let me take it to another level. Sure. A, a man's gift will make room for him. So let's say that there is, that, that, I'm, uh, that I've been invited to a house. And it's a, a very um, affluent person, very wealthy person. You walk up to the door, 
and uh, you know you're a little intimidated by the house, by the cars in the driveway, by all of the stuff. You have an invitation in your hand, a personal handwritten invitation from that person that says, you have something that I need. I'm inviting you to my house. Please come. When you get there, op just, just open the door. Okay, Here, here's the picture of this verse. That the house, my gift, has given an open door to that house. But let's say that I got my, I have my invitation in my hand. I go to the house, intimidated, open the door, you know, kind of, kind of gently turn the knob. It's open. It's, it's unlocked. You open the door, sling it open. It opens freely, but you, you allow the Im intimidation and who you think you are to make you not enter into the house, to share your gift with the person of the house, but you stand out on the other side of the threshold because I'm not worthy to enter in. How many people, Barry, are praying, receiving an invitation? The door is open, but they're refusing to walk into the house because they're intimidated and don't see themselves as worthy of entering it. Yeah. Let me give you an example. Uh, years ago, when I was pastoring, there was a guy who was my uh, was the the treasurer, uh, secretary treasurer for the for the for Shady C. Amazing man. He was he was kind of for a long time was kind of my right hand. We didn't have a lot of men at first. We ended up later on having more, but uh, it was kind of me and Randy and and a, a lot of ladies there. And um, Randy was he was a big teddy bear. He, he was he'd been raised on the panhandle in the in the armpit of Florida. There uh, was was an amazing man but never saw himself as such. And I knew this guy had a heart for the father. I mean, it, when I'd be teaching, preaching, I'd look out and see just tears are rolling down his cheeks. And, you know, as, as usual, we opened with prayer, we closed with prayer. And, and one day I just, I got taught a lesson. I said, Randy, would you uh, close this in prayer? He looked up and said, Mike, I don't pray in public. Okay, awkward moment taught me something that you don't ask somebody to do something unless you've, you know, talked to something like that is as intimate as that. And, um, it was a year later, probably we were standing in a, in a group. Uh, we started a Tuesday night prayer meeting and we were standing there all together, holding hands It's Tuesday night. And, um, all of a sudden I heard this voice. It was Randy praying. Tears welled up in my eyes, and I heard this anointing come from this man. And I thought to myself, how much have we missed? Because Randy uh, has passed away now of blessed memory. How much have we missed because Randy had a gift, but he withheld it from us for that time? I have a similar story. I have an elder in our congregation that used to be a self-described wallflower, yeah. shy, supportive, yeah. encouraging behind the scenes, faithful to attend. Very much like Randy. I know who you're talking about. <laughs> but not really engaged. And I heard his passion for those that were sick. Mm -hmm. Father spoke to me one evening here at the house and said, you call Johnny, tell him to meet you at House of David and bring his Talit. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Johnny has something I like. He has a black to lead. Mm. A nice one. So when I called him and told him to meet me in House of David and bring his to lead, he said, okay, brother, I'll be there. I sat down with him and I gave him a small bottle of oil and I said, the father says that you are anointed of him to pray for the sick. Mm. And this is what you are to do. And I instructed him how to place oil on people. I said, you, play, you pray in your private time under this to lead for people to be healed. And when you pray for them, you lay this to lead around their shoulders, anoint them with oil and pray a prayer. It's not in how loud you pray. It's not in how forceful you pray. You just obey, you pray, and the Father will do the healing. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and said, okay. <laughs> Today, the man that you see on Shabbat, oh. opening up our, our gathering by blowing the shofar, that shofar mm -hmm. will, will knock you down. And then standing up after we've worshipped in music and dance to exhort the people, with a word, this past Shabbat, he said, I'm loud. <laughs> I said, yes, you are. <laughs> but, I mean, he brings a bold word. He exhorts. He edifies. And he's not a wallflower anymore. Oh, no, the wallflower is kind of transformed into an oak tree. That man was always what it is now, but it was locked down inside. Sometimes, Mike, we need to be the ones to hand somebody the key and tell them it's okay for you to demonstrate your gift. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people are intimidated by other people demonstrating their gift and flowing in it. Well, I can never be like them. Yeah. No one's asking anyone to be like someone else. We're we're encouraging you today on this video to hear the heart of the Father and whatever it is. Some people don't know what their gift is. Mm. Some people have asked, you know, I know someone they've asked repetitively, what gifting do you have? And they've got nothing. But if you ask them to do something, they're going to do it. If you yeah. need something, they're going to try to make that happen for you. So it could be a gift of helps. Sometimes people's gifting is simply to help other people do what they do. But on the day when we stand before Messiah, if you're faithful to that gift, you will be as rewarded as the one you helped. Oh, yeah. Oh, so yeah. Yes. Find, okay. find a, a niche somewhere and step mm -hmm. into it. You never know. Yeah, a, a gift is seeing something and going and, and saying, you know, I need to take care of that. Instead of waiting for someone to tell you to do something, your gift is calling you into something. Now, something interesting happened uh, this, uh, this past Shabbat at Life's Assembly. Uh, we were talking about, I've been talking about Betzel and, and Ohaliav and, and the various people that were involved in the tabernacle. Uh, and you know, this the tabernacle is kind of a passion of mine anyway. Um, so there's, you, you remember, I've gone through at the end of the first session, there's some scriptures or, or some thoughts out of scriptures that I, I have, this is who you are. Yes. Okay. And, um, I did that a, a number of years ago. I have no idea where I was at. And someone came up and handed me a piece of paper right here. Um, it has no name on it. It has no website. It has nothing, anything that I can reference who and where this came from. But it is a list. Can you see that fairly well? Yes. Of, of thoughts. Let me give you one. Um, uh, you know, I can do all things through Messiah. Philippians 4.13. Um, I am filled with the fullness of Yudhe Bhavhe, Ephesians 3.19. And it, I mean, this is about probably 40 or so uh, thoughts like that based upon scriptures with the scripture attached to it. And so at the end of the service, I read this uh, out loud at, at Life Assembly. And um, I said, you know, what would, and, and people are just like, I can see people just coming alive. 
as I'm as I'm reading these verses into them. And at the end, I said, what would happen? What would happen if we really believed that? What, what would happen if we if we took a 30-day period? You know, it, it says that it takes uh, about 30 days to really start to change our mindset. And I said, what would happen if we took a 30-day period and we read these, these thoughts and, and began to look at the verses behind them? And uh, Daniel is at the back. He says, I'm in. <laughs> I said, okay, all right. And I started rolling with it. And I said, so what would happen if we each did this out loud? You know, in the privacy of your own, your own prayer time, whatever, your own devotional time. But we read it out loud into the spirit. There's something that happens when we voice things, not just in our brain, but we, we, it actually comes out of our mouth. That truth comes forth into the earthly realm. I said, what would happen if we did that? And they're like, well, let's do it. So I had copies for everybody, and I passed out copies. And so my challenge was that yesterday, uh, those of, of our congregation would sometime during the day spend, it, it takes three, four minutes, really, uh, maybe five minutes if you read slowly and, and kind of you know thoughtful, um, to, to read these out loud, we're in day two right now as we're recording. And I, I can tell you, my wife, I asked her last night, I said, you know, how is, uh, you know, what do you, how are you doing with it? She said, well, I didn't wait till the first. I, she started immediately. <laughs> um, she started immediately, started making notes. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm in the day two here. Um, I plan on doing this together on Shabbat with our congregation. So I, I'm going to pass this challenge out to uh, to everyone, or, or offer this. Okay, I'm just going to offer this to everyone that's that listens to me, that listens to you and I. Um, I have this on a PDF. I'm going to be out of the office for just a little bit after the recordings, but uh, I've got this on PDF. It'll probably I'll be back in the office about the time Barry gets this up online. Uh, if you'd like this, but no no strings attached, just just uh, send me an email. And Barry, maybe you can tag my email address there of h i n e n i at mac dot com m a c dot com, and that's the word Hanani. Uh, when Abram was told, uh, you know, Abram, Abram, he said uh, Hanani, or here I'm I. So this is this is available, and I, I'd love to see, you know, I'd love to see thousands of people uh, getting involved in in doing this, and and. Um, because I, I believe it can transform their lives. Agree. I remember reading that list in a book. Uh, man, this has been 30 years ago, probably, Mike, that I bought a book um, and a man was dealing with counseling different styles of mm -hmm. issues in people's lives. That was the original one that I do. That I, that actually came out of that book that you're talking about. I can't remember the guy's name. I can't Anderson, remember. I believe it was Anderson's his last name. He was a professor at a a Christian mm -hmm. university. It starts with a B, and it's not Baylor University. It's <laughs> something else. Uh, and I'm I've been sitting here trying to think what was the name of that place, that place, that place, like thirty years ago. But there's. That list is in that book, and I remember reading that. And at first, you start reading it, then you think, I'm just going to skim down because, you know, it's just a long list. But then you just stop, and you say, no, 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 wait a minute. Yeah. Mike, you told me something other many times that it's hard for me to grasp. I talk about my... Uh, early years in home life and the way my parents raised us and that kind of thing. And it was positive. You know, we, we weren't well off by any imagination. Uh, we weren't dirt poor, but we didn't have a lot of things that uh, my peers had, but what we did have was a home full of prayer and love and, and honesty, integrity and those kinds of things. And I, I'm someone who's never heard my parents yell at each other, ever. Mm. My dad, a blessed memory, 
left behind a legacy that anybody who knows him struggles to even start to keep up with. Yeah. So you've told me, Barry, you have to understand that most people have no idea what you're talking about. I understand I've had to learn over the years to understand that people come out of situations where they've been beaten down, they've been discouraged, they've been told they can't, they've been told they're nothing. They have all of this communication toward them that is belittling, confining, restricting, mm -hmm. limiting. And that's that's their tunnel vision. That's the what that's what they see in the mirror. That's who they hear in their voice. That's how who they are on the inside. But Mike, I see Yeshua standing at the at the gate to the sheepfold and calling out that one particular sheep of such mindset and being tender and caregiving and pouring oil over that sheep's head yeah. and call them, I need you to lead. I trust your heart enough that you will let me use you to lead or to function in some significant way. How many times in scripture do we see that Yah calls somebody and their basic response is, who me? <laughs> you know, yeah. Gideon was such a person. Who are you talking to? What are you talking about? But then I see, I think of the blind man that when Yeshua says, what do you want that I might receive my sight? And he casts his beggar's garment to the side. I don't need this anymore. I'm desperate enough to get my healing right now. I say to you, man, your sins are forgiven. Rise up, take your bed and walk. Mm -hmm. If you're tired of being on the bed and crippled, if you're tired of being blind, if you're tired of being limited, if you're tired of it all not working out, Yeshua today is saying, I have something for you if you're willing and desperate and urgent and fervent enough to come to me for it. It doesn't take a, a, um, a privileged or a, a blessed upbringing, Mike. Yah specializes in pulling people out of the ditch and causing mm -hmm. them to walk on the road. He knows how to do that. Oh, yeah. But that which he wants to give to us is not for us. No. I, I, just, I just read um, uh, Rob Cook, you, you know, that I, uh, it's one of my favorite rabbinic teachers. Uh, Rob Cook in the, I, I've got it here on my computer, in uh, the blessings that we say during the time of Rosh Kodesh, the new moon, uh, part of that, the, the beginning of that is, um, let me just read it here. Um, May it be your will, the eternal Elohim, to grant us long life, a life of peace, a life of goodness, a life of blessing, sustenance, vigor of the bones, a life marked by reverence of heaven and dread of sin, a life without shame or embarrassment, a life of riches and honor, a life in which we have love of Torah and awe of heaven, life in which you will fulfill our heartfelt desires for good. And Rob Cook goes on to explain that one of, um, of blessing, a life of blessing. And here it is. Not blessing that we receive, but blessing that we give. Uh, May we bring blessing to the world through our actions, helping the needy, consoling the brokenhearted, and providing moral leadership and direction. That's called recognizing that you have a gift. And the gift is making room for you. Uh, I challenge people. I, I had a conversation with someone the other day, and they said, I'm just not sure what to do. I said, just ask that the Father would, would just begin to, to show you things, to speak to you. And it may be, you know, it's like a child. Um, I, I've watched our, our granddaughter now learning how to walk. Uh, it oh. was it was little steps. Oh. Yeah, I know it's it's too too cute. Yeah, it, it, was, it was you know trying to learn how to stand up, cruising the furniture, uh, you know falling down, but now she's like cruising all over the place, you know <laughs> running back and forth. Uh, don't expect to do a marathon. 
if you haven't figured out how to stand up yet. But in order to do a marathon, you got to learn how to stand up. Take the little things the Father would show you. Yeah. Begin to pray that the Father would show you. But then let your prayer turn into action. Because, he, you know, he, he doesn't give us an opportunity, another opportunity, until we've completed the one he gave us before. So if he's told you to stand up, and you refuse to stand up, but you're praying for the marathon, go back to where the first opportunity was. Learn how to take that little step. The little step will become a bigger step. Before we go today, Mike, I want to give our viewers a little exercise. And you may have already done this. Sometimes it's good to go back and do an exercise again. You take out a sheet of paper and sit down quietly somewhere and write down the following three questions. Number one, what do I dream about? When you're sitting alone and when you're just daydreaming, when you're imagining with your mind and you see yourself doing things, what is that? Mm. Number two, what do you laugh about? What is it that just sparks laughter out of you, um, um, brings joy to your life? And then number three, what do you cry about? Mm -hmm. What breaks your heart? What will bring tears to your eyes? Mm -hmm. And write down as much as you can to the answers of each of those three questions and take that into your prayer closet. That Those three questions will help you to begin many times to streamline, mm -hmm. to, to kind of formulate a bit in the presence of the master what he is saying, what, how he has wired you on the inside, and do not compare yourself to someone else. He wired you yeah. to be unique in your estimation, perspective, and how you respond to things intentionally and on purpose because he needs you to do that while someone else is doing something else, and the two will link together eventually. Uh, I, you, you're different than I am. And you may <laughs> say, well, thank you, Father, for that. And we're different. But the Father has enabled us to partner together over the years in many different avenues and opportunities. And there's just a unique ability to communicate between us. It happens. Mm -hmm. But neither one of us are trying to be the other. We, I know who you are. I know how you're going to respond in many times. I know where your brain seems to, to, to filter and think. And I'm sure you do it for me as well. It's just sometimes people work together well. Sometimes someone needs to work over there while I work over here. True. But we still get the kingdom work done. That's right. So uh, it, be encouraged. Yah's got a place. He's got roles for us. And it's when we do those things in the place he assigns to us, kingdom work gets done. And that's what's important. Speaking of, I got to get online with uh, somebody that's a little closer to where the kingdom's going to be uh, than, than we are, and that's Hanok. Well, our warm wishes and hellos to Hanok. And folks, thank you for watching Foundations for Life. Um, I will be posting the uh, email address for Mike, so be sure you get the list and start reading that out loud every day to yourself. Um, maybe bring your the folks in your home together with you and everyone read it together. Uh, be a great way to start your day. Share this on your social media pages and tune yes. in your next week because we'll be back. So until then, Mike, shalom, brother. Shalom. <laughs>